Hello, everyone, and welcome to this aquafit.com webinar on advances in pre and post extrusion technologies. My name is Lucia Barreiro, and I am the editor of aquafit.com. Aquaculture is the fastest growing animal production sector, and feed is its largest operational expense. Aquafit production has special requirements in manufacturing technology due to the unique physiology of aquatic animals. Extrusion is the heart of an aquafit meal, but it requires a well-designed pre- and post-extrusion process to ensure the desired final product and meet the nutritional requirements of aquatic animals. For this webinar, we have a great panel with major players that will discuss some of the recent advances in pre- and post-extrusion technology to optimize the aquafit production process. Thanks to the support of our sponsors, Titian and Bangor Manufacturing, this webinar is open and free. In addition to the mainstream extrusion topics, one of our speakers, Jack Vainost, will discuss a different form of aquafit production, not to replace dry extruder feed, but as an alternative that requires a different way of thinking. Each speaker will give a 15 minute presentation and then we will get to a final panel session to answer questions from the audience. To send me a question, please type it in the Q&A box. All, all our webinars will be available on our website and on YouTube. Especially thanks to our assistant editor and webinar manager, Marisa Yanaga, who is making sure all our webinars work. And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Joe Kearns, who will be moderating this webinar. Joe graduated from Kansas State University in engineering. He worked for Vanguard for 42 years and had nine patents in extrusion for Vanguard. Joe has been operating JP Kearns Consulting for the past three years on extrusion and plan related topics. Joe, hand it over to you. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm also impressed with the lineup that we have today, and, and I believe we're going to start off with Vulcan. Vulcan is a uh, sales manager at Tijin. He has a degree in process engineering from the University of Applied Science in Hamburg, more than five years experience in bulk handling materials uh, in uh, section with a wide range of uh, experience in grinding and sieve technologies. He's worked very hard, I know, because I have personal experience with him in developing energy efficient grinding solutions that meet the highest demands in terms of fineness and capacity, which is the most important thing in an aquatic feed plant for both aquatic feeds and pet foods, of course. You need a good grinding system. His primary clients are mainly in Europe, Middle East, North Africa, and Asia. His current role is responsible for sales, market development, and projects, but I'll tell you, he's a technical guy that's unbelievable. Vulcan, take it over. Hello and uh, welcome everybody. Um, I, so thank you very much for the introduction um, and welcome every, everybody to the Aquafeed webinar. Um, in today's seminar on grinding solutions, um, I would like uh, to present about the importance of the particle size distribution. So why does it matter? And I also would like to make a comparison between single stage and double stage grinding and I would like to conclude this presentation with a, a short uh, case study on um, ultra fine grinding, for example, for shrimp feed. So uh, on the following chart, um, you can see a simple illustration uh, um, of a fish feed production plant um, and its main process steps from the raw material reception over the grinding and extrusion area uh, up to the um, drying, coating and packaging process. And we at Tietjen, we are dedicated to grinding and this since 1924. So uh, we built grinding systems for more than 60 years and we implement also um, separation technologies such as sieving and sifting units. So we are located very much in the north of Germany in Hemding, it's near Hamburg, and we sold over 2,100 systems worldwide. So for more information, please check out our homepage at, under teachin-original.com. So, um, Let's start. So grinding is the first step of making high quality aqua feed because the grinding is the first stage um, which changes the physical properties of the raw material. So, and, and particle size reduction is required to improve the feed uh, utilization. From the standpoint of, uh, of nutrition, the smaller the particle size, the more surface area can be uh, assessed by the digestive enzymes for better digestibility. 
And therefore, the feed particle size needs to be small enough to meet uh, the needs of the target species. The tiger shrimp, for example, needs to be raised very quickly and they have a small mouth and digestive tract. So they require a finely ground, nutrient dense aqua feed for op optimal growth. And due to their eating habits, um, they require excellent feed uh, with water stability. So one, another important factor uh, why particle size matter is, uh, is that it's, it has impacts on each subsequent process steps. So if we have a look on the extruder, if we have a very small particle, uh, we, uh, this particle has also an increased surface area and this leads uh, to a faster cook when the material is uh, subjected to the condition of the extruder. If you have, comp compared to that, if you have coarser material, it takes longer time, it takes more energy and, the, and therefore it's, it's not very good. Um, then if you have smaller particles and a very narrow particle size distribution, this has also, uh, this makes the extrusion process more predictable and, and unflecting in operation and leads also to a feed with a very good um, water stability and uh, also um, increases the binding properties and reduces therefore the pro uh, product breakage and fines. This is also an important fa factor for RAS systems, for recycling aqu aquaculture system, as it reduces the load on filter systems and, and the maintenance costs. And all, all, uh, on the Gris spectrum has also a very important um, impact on the drying process and coating process because due to the increased uh, surface area and the, the, the cell structure and the pores that can absorb better uh, the uh, liquids for coating. And thirdly, there are marketing advantages. With a good uh, grist spectrum, you have a superior pellet appearance and uniformity. Uh, of course, reduce feed base due to better uh, digestibility and of course, sustainability is also a very important factor, which, which comes even more important in the future. So let's have a look how particle size distribution is accomplished by an hammer mill system. Um, here you can see a very uh, fast rotating um, rotor with equipped with hammers and stationary, uh, stationary screens here inserted. The raw, the raw material is fed from the top into the grinding chamber and uh, the, the particle size reduction is accomplished by uh, the hit from the beta to the particle size, uh, to the particle. And in the very top of the um, grinding system, there you can see special designed impact plates. They serve as an impact surface and uh, um, also reduce the, the, the velocity of the particles after the, after the hit they get from the hammer. So uh, this is uh, important because uh, then we have a very high energy trans transition into the particle and therefore a fine, a fine uh, uh, particle size. And if the particles are fine enough, they can leave the screens and, and leave the hammer system. If not, they will stay in the grinding chamber as soon as they are fine enough. So let's have a look uh, on the impact point. On the impact point, you can see when the hammer hit the particles, there uh, it creates very small particles bigger particles and yeah, very, very big particles. And this is why we are not talking about uniform particles. We are talking always about a particle size distribution. So here on this chart, you can see uh, in the horizontal axis, the fineness from very fine material up to coarse material and on the vertical axis, uh, the amount of individual fractions. So this is a density curve. And and on the, on the example on the left, you can see a very narrow uh, grist spectrum with a steep uh, up and a steep down rise. This means the particles are very much concentrated here at the dotted line, the mean, mean diameter. So this is an example for a good, uh, good grist spectrum, yeah, but, but it serves just an, as an illustration. On the other side, on the right hand side, you can see the particle size distribution which has a very wide grist spectrum. So it means very uh, uh, amount, uh, higher amount of fines and also in a higher amount uh, of coarse particles. And the mean diameter is also a little bit shifted more to the right. So this is an example for a wide, wide particle size distribution. And this is what we mainly don't want to achieve. Okay, so optical, uh, the characteristics of an optimum particle size reduction is also 
um, the, the grinding has an impact on the raw material and it's important to have as uh, less mechanical stress on the product as possible so that the material is discharged as, as soon as possible. Because then we have also a low temperature increase uh, um, in, the, in the product and we do not want to digest or to cook uh, the, the product in the, in the grinding chamber. Because then afterwards in the extrusion, you need to put water again into the system and at the dry air, you have to take it out again. So this is not desired. Yeah. And other positive effects on the process are higher throughputs, for example, through a narrow particle size distribution and small particles, you, have higher, you can achieve higher throughputs throughout the extruder. You have less wear and you have energy savings, not only in the extrusion system, but in, in the other as well. So if we have a look on this chart on the horizontal axis, we can see the fineness. Um, now here defined as D95 and D98. This means this is a top cut of the particle size distribution. And in here in, in the red area, you can see the requirements for aqua feed. So they, now, nowadays they are, they are going more and more to the fine area. So when we are now talking about 181 uh, for fine grinding between 180 to 250 micron in aquatic feeds, the trend goes more and more to the fine area, even below 100 micron. And we at Tietjen, we, we can provide the entire range of grinding solution to provide uh, the right equipment. So if we have a uh, look at the at the coarser grind, I would say so fine grinding for for bigger for bigger feet, this is mainly achieved by hammer mills um, typically, and it's also an option to compare hammer mills with with the kind of separation um, technology such as sieves or sifters, and for some recipe composition. So nowadays, the um, vegetable proteins become more and more important. And in order to protect the very thin screens inside the hammer mill, it's uh, to be considerable to uh, put a pre-crush on top of the hammer mill, just uh, to give the hard particles a pre-crack and let the hammer mill system and do the job for fine grinding. So a typical single stage grinding um, process can look like, like this. So a hammer mill with a feeding system, aspiration and dedusting uh, system and a mechanical discharge. It's also possible to uh, perform uh, double stage grinding. And this means uh, two hammer mills equipped with different uh, screen sizes in order to reach uh, finer particle sizes. And for the reason, if, if there are a, a high content of hard, hard particles, it's also considerable to, to put in a small pre-crush on, uh, on top of the hammer mill. So this is a single stage. It has not uh, the, the same, it's not comparable to a standard double stage grinding because this is a dedicated grinding system and this is just a pre-crusher. If you have a look on the particle size distribution um, for a single stage grinding, uh, the particle size curve can look like this. If we compare it to a double stage grinding process under the assumption both have the same recipe composition, you, uh, you can expect a particle, si particle, particle size distribution like this. And what happened if you compare both particle size distributions the particle size distributions are shifted in the double stage grinding more into the area of fines. So the mean diameter is more shifted into the area of fines. We have a higher a steep curve in the beginning and also a steep fall of the curve at the end. But for both, for both particle size distribution, you have the same width. This, this means here you have also, uh, in this finer grind, you have also coarser particles. With double, with double stage grinding, you can, of course, decrease this, those amounts. So if you have now here the percentage, so you have less coarse particles compared to a standard uh, single stage grinding, but the particles are still uh, in the particle size distribution. If you now compare it to a single stage grinding, including pre-crusher, um, you can see that the, this, um, this curve uh, is in between of both, but it's uh, more, uh, more, uh, lines to the single stage grinding. Um, it's, it's also compared to the first uh, single grinding stage, it's also shifted more to uh, the, di the, the mean diameter shifted more in the area of fines. You have also a steep curve, but the amount of fines, if you compare it, is not as high as in double stage grinding. So if you look at this cockpit, um, we can just uh, compare, um, uh, compare the, the advantages and disadvantages. 
So um, double stage grinding um, provides, as we have seen, a very narrow particle size distribution. It has compared to both uh, compared to the single stage and the other method, it has the highest amount um, of, uh, if you look just at the point of 250 micron, which is uh, an important factor when we talk about fine, uh, fine grinding. And it, 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 it serves also a better uh, capacity compared to both. On the other hand, this uh, setup requires also a higher invest. And also you need, you need the space also in the, in the aquatic feed plant in order, in order to bring both equipments uh, uh, in this factory. So on the other side, you can achieve also for, for larger feeds with a single stage grinding, it's, uh, you have less, less and test and you have still a homogeneous grist spectrum and, and a very good uh, quality. If we now take, uh, take a look and um, we want and, and, and have a look on the top cuts below 400 micron, this is not, uh, not achieve, uh, this is typically not achievable or in, yeah, reliable, in a reliable process with hammer mill systems because the, the screen size needs to be decreased and then uh, with high fat and protein rich products, it can cause problems. And so for, for the shrimp feeds that I've shown earlier with, this, with the sinking feed application of producing directly extruded 0.5 millimeter pellets, it requ requires another grinding technology. For this reason, we recommend our impact classifier. Mill. So let's have a look into this impact classifier mill system. It has an, it has an air suction and uh, the product will be fed pneumatically uh, with, the, with the air into the grinding chamber. The mare, air, main airflow uh, is, from, is fed from underneath the grinding disc. The grinding disc is, is equipped with hammers and rotating with uh, up to 100 meters per second. And um, the, if the particle size is, uh, has the right uh, has the right size and is fine enough. It can pass the classifier on the top of this machine, and and leaves the particles uh, uh, together to the final product. And if we have uh, a look on the particle size distribution for such kind of machine, um, we can see um, here now. Here is the, is the finest on the horizontal axis. And we can see two curves. This is the curve that I have shown before. That's a density curve. And here you have the uh, sum curve. But if you look at, at this at the same curve, you can see it is a very narrow particle size distribution. And the, the, the top cut is very steep. So if we are talking about extruding 0 0.50 0 millimeter pellets, then um, the top cut is, is very important because we don't want to have die blockages at the extruder. We want uh, the highest avail availability at the extruder and no down, down times. So, and at the end, I want to present a, show, a short case study on, on this, um, uh, on the application for shrimp feed. So the, the capacity for this um, case study was uh, the target capacity four tons per hour. The target fineness was 95% uh, smaller, 250 micron. And the raw material uh, already contains an amount of 47%, which is equal to two tons, uh, which is already fine, uh, fine uh, the, the amount of fines which is in the raw material. So typically, uh, many aquafeed plants, you can see the setup that uh, you have a hammer mill system in front of the fine grinding stage. And uh, this is often though, because the, the, there is already a hammer mill system um, in the plant that, that's, that can be used um, as a, as a pre-grinder for, for, for the fine grinding technology. Come, uh, mainly the fine grinding technologies need a pre-grind. Pre so what happens here is the raw material was 47% um, were, um, were, were processed by the hammer mill system. And after the hammer mill system, um, the amount of smaller 250 micron was increased to 75%. This means the grinding process is uh, up to 28%, uh, and the effective capacity uh, of, of the hammer mill system is one ton. So we have two tons already in the raw material, and the hammer mill increased it by three tons. So, and then the product is fed to this, um, to this grinding technology, and this technology um, just increases the amount from 75% up to 95%, which means 20% grinding progress, which is equal now to approximate one ton. 
And if you compare it to our solution, uh, which, which, uh, which uh, has the advantage that it can process the raw material in a single stage, we have a grinding process of 40, uh, of nearly uh, 50% and an effective capacity of two tons per hour. The single stage grinding has also the advantage that it can uh, um, work as a dedicated grinding line. But the main advantage of the single stage grinding with the TICM system is that uh, the, the, the energy concern, the specific energy consumption per ton of this setup here in double stage grinding is uh, 25 uh, uh, to 30% higher compared, compared to the TICM system. So in terms of energy savings, in terms of sustainability, this is a very good solution. So just to sum up with this single stage super fine grinding, we can produce feeds smaller with 100 micron and also with top cuts of 98% or even 99. For the case study, the set point was 95%. So with this machine, you could even achieve higher top cuts. And the one other main advantage is that this machine don't require any uh, kind of control system because it has, it, it acts as a grinder and classifier in one machine. So the benefits of this machine is that it provides a very fine and homogeneous particle size distribution. It has a less temperature increase and it processes the material directly in one stage. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me at the Q&A. Yes. <clears throat> Questions? Sorry, Joe, I can't hear you. Yeah, Joe, you are muted. Thank you very much. Sorry for that, uh, Vulcan. Most interesting. I believe that shows very well that you can hit full range of uh, particle sizes, which allow you to make uh, the full range of aquatic feeds, even down to the ultra small sizes as in a half a millimeter in diameter. So very nice. <clears throat> Up next, we have Ed DeSouza. Ed DeSouza graduated in agribusiness at Fort Hayes State in the great state of Kansas. And he, uh, he concluded his Master of Business Administration with focus on business management uh, down in uh, Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil, state of Sao Paulo. Ed was hired by Winger in 95, 1995, and he's worked for Winger for the last 23 years. He has done a lot of work with the, in terms of development and know-how in the food extrusion process. And he's worked at the Technical Center in Sabetha, Kansas uh, for quite some time over the last uh, years. He has a lot of uh, experience as a service technician on equipment startups, process troubleshooting, as well as providing lectures and training for extrusion projects. He's a member of the Brazilian College of Animal Nutrition on the Pet Food Committee, CBNA, uh, since 2012. He lives in Bellino, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and uh, has been serving uh, Winger customers as the extrusion system process director. I've known Ed for a long time, and he's a really great guy, and he's uh, extremely uh, friendly with the guys in the plant and teaches them quite nicely how to get the job done. So Ed, take over. Thank you, Joe. It's a great pleasure to be here and share a little bit of our knowledge and learn from you as well. So is my screen up? Yes, it's okay. Okay. Ed, we, we cannot hear you. It looks like his screen might be frozen. Um, maybe we can, we can move on to the next speaker, Joe, and, okay. and see if, if Ed solves his technical issues. Oh, Joe, you're muted. Yeah. 
No, oh, you're still muted. <laughs> Okay, Can you now. hear me now? Yeah. Okay. It looks like Ed is having a bit of technical difficulties. So if it's agreeable with Peter Raven, we'll move on to Peter and come back and pick up Ed here in, a, in the next session. Peter, are you ready? Yeah, I, I hope. Okay. <laughs> Let's Peter try it. Is, Peter has a long history, and I've known him for quite a long time, uh, especially it started way back when the salmon feed industry wanted to start increasing the oil levels. And between, uh, at the time, Denison and Winger, a lot of uh, work was done to figure out how to do this. But in any case, Peter had a lot of input in that. And he has over 30 years experience in the development and realization of projects as a project manager for feed, aquatic feeds, and pet foods. He's been working at Denison for over 20 years as an account manager in the feed, aquatic, and pet food division. He's a specialist in developing large value added projects focused on pneumatic conveying, mixing, grind, grinding, coating with liquids and powder systems. So here we have it. Peter, take over. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, thanks for your nice words. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, what I want to share with you today is um, the vacuum core coating. That is um, a step in the processing line. Um, Joe, I can see you quite well, I have to say, but I would like to see my own screen. Something goes wrong, I think. Your screen is on my computer. Okay. Okay, now we can see you, Peter. Okay. Can you see my screen? Uh, no, now your screen is not being shared. Okay, let me one second, please. Okay, now, now you should be able to see it. Yes, we can see your screen now. My screen is on? Yes. Okay, okay, let's start. <laughs> See your screen um, and we can hear you. So what See I want to share with you today is, um, okay. So what I want to share with you today is um, um, the equipment that Denison supplies for um, aqua feed and especially the vacuum core coating uh, processes. Um, the equipment for 25 years, so we have quite some experience in that. Um, just in short, I, uh, my name is Peter Raven, so I work for the company Denison. Um, we're located in the Netherlands. Um, Denison started something like, uh, wow, uh, quite a long time ago uh, with the production of equipment for milling, mixing, and conveying equipment. And today we are uh, employing 220 people and we're supplying our processes worldwide. Um, as I said before, uh, today, I want to share with you the equipment that we supply um, as almost the last step in the production uh, for Aquafeed. And um, what you see on the screen is our uh, vacuum coaters. It's uh, at Denison, we call it a Pegasus mixer with the capability of uh, the creation of vacuum. So the kibbles are coated under an vacuum atmosphere. Um, what is vacuum coating? And um, vacuum coating is the addition of a liquid or a mixture of liquids, or it can even be an emulsion of a liquid with fine powders. And this is added to an extruded or a pellet under vacuum conditions. Um, and that is special, of course, uh, with a vacuum coater, these vacuum conditions that allows you to add more to the kibble. Um, the question is, why would you be using, why would you use a vacuum coater? And uh, probably, probably the first uh, answer will be to infuse higher liquid levels. Uh, when you want to infuse a lot of oil in your pellet, you will really want to have the liquid penetrate the, the kibble with 
so, so, uh, the standard equipment that is on the market, um, somewhere you're at the end. It's not possible anymore to add higher um, levels of liquid. Um, well, at Denison, we have some test equipment, and um, I'll show you that later in the clip. And, and then we can check what is really possible. How much can you really infuse? Um, well, if you want to infuse higher level, uh, higher levels of liquid, then probably vacuum coating is a solution. But that's not all. Also, of course, the improving of your energy content. You want to add more energy, improve palatability. Um, you want to add and protect expensive ingredients. It's um, like drugs, um, vitamins, colorants, just name it. Um, for a flexible production line control, um, it's not just vacuum coating um, that in the end decides the quality of your palate or you extrude it. It's the complete line um, that, that in the end um, gives you best palate quality. Um, and then we're talking about, uh, as I said before, it's grinding, mixing, um, the preconditioning, extrusion, drying, and as a last step, probably vacuum coating. The complete line is what gives you, in the end, um, a, a, a good product. Um, well, next steps, uh, flexible batch control. It's a batch system that we supply. And in the end, what we're doing is uh, we're trying to capsule, coat, extra that's pallets. Um, in Aquafeed, that is, uh, when, when will you be using vacuum coating? Um, in the end, you have probably problems with the kibbles, with the pallets, as you supply them today. Uh, in Aquafeed, what major problems can be is water stability or pollution, for example. Um, with, a, with a vacuum coater, um, it is possible that you can solve these problems. Again, later in the presentation, you will see how we do that. So um, in next sheets, what I will show you is the process for vacuum core coating, then what equipment do we use, and some of the innovations that we have available today. First, the process. Um, it's very important to understand the process of, of vacuum coating. Um, you see here it is explained in, uh, in seven steps. And first step is we have an extruded product coming from the extruder, from the dryer, and it goes towards the, in, towards the vacuum coater. So in the vacuum coater, we have a batch as said before. And it's a, a dry coated, pro, a dry uncoated product. Um, so what we do then is, with a vacuum uh, pump, we, um, we what we try to do is we try to take the air out of the pores of the extruder. So on this sheet, what you see is we have the air still in there, and with the vacuum pump, we take the air out. It's going to take some seconds, and once the air is out. Then what we're going to do is we're going to inject um, a liquid or mix of liquids on the on the on the on the surface of the pallet. And once the liquid is um, well distributed, homogeneous uh, on on the on on the pallet, then next step is to break the the, the vacuum. And during breaking of the vacuum of the vacuum. The liquid infuses in the core of the of the kibble of the pallet. So then there is a possibility to add another um, top coating, a hardener, just name it. And after three, four minutes, depending on the number of additions uh, and the sequence, you have a final product where your liquid or your mixture of liquids is inside the kibble. Um, I have a clip here available. I hope. Um, it goes well. And this is to show you what really happens when, when the vacuum breaks. Oh. So what you see here on the screen is um, we have a, 
a uh, small portion of kibbles. Um, we're adding oil. And um, of course, that is not real life coating in a vacuum coater. Uh, this is just to show you what happens in, uh, when, when you add a liquid to a kibble, to a pellet um, under vacuum conditions. My colleague is now, he's generating the, the vacuum. So right now we are already under quite a deep vacuum. Um, and actually what you see is not a lot has happened. The kibbles are still floating on the oil. So at this moment, we are in the phase where we have a deep vacuum. What my colleague is gonna do next is he's gonna break the vacuum. You can see that on the gauge, the vacuum is breaking. So air is now entering the system. And what you can now already see is, is that the kibbles are sinking. And when kibbles are sinking, that means they are much heavier. So this is more or less the proof that a kibble is heavier than oil. Most of the kibbles, what you see here, is they're, they're heavier than oil. So the, the, the specific density has increased tremendously. And this is more or less what vacuum coating does. So by absorbing the oil that you have added, the kibble gets heavier. Well, what's the happening again? We need to we need to go to the next sheet. Yeah, um, when we're going to uh, salmon feed, you want to add a lot of uh, of oil, but not as much as in the previous clip. Um, I will run this clip now again, and here what we're doing is we're adding forty percent of an oil to a kibble, and immediately you see that it's not as much anymore as it was before, where we were at. Uh, at really soaking the kibble in the, in, in the oil. So this is uh, more of a, li a real life recipe where we're adding the approximately 40% of an oil to a kibble. Uh, my colleague is, uh, is, is, is uh, dividing the oil over the pellets and that's what he's doing with his, uh, with, with his hand mixing the, the, the kibbles. Now he's breaking the, the vacuum. So the air is coming back into the system and the air will uh, push the oil in the kibbles. It's, uh, the sequence is a little slower right now. Um, so the air is uh, pushing the, 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 the oil slowly in the kibbles. On the goat, you can see the, the pressure. The pressure was deep vacuum, uh, 200 millibars approximately. Uh, and right now it's uh, approximately back on atmospheric conditions. In this phase of breaking the vacuum, the oil penetrates in the kibbles. And that is what you can see now in detail. You can see that there is no more free oil and the oil has infused in the kibbles. Okay, that was a test, uh, now real life. This is a clip of uh, seen through the inspection doors of our uh, vacuum coater. It's not on the vacuum, obviously. It's not possible because of the open hatches. Here, what you see is that the uh, vacuum coater is filled with a batch of kibbles. That's gonna take approximately 20 to 30 seconds. Kibbles are inside. And uh, typically, normally what you're doing is you're generating the vacuum. Well, we don't have a vacuum right now, but what I wanna show you here is uh, the injection of a liquid on the kibbles. So what you see here is the oil being sprayed through nozzles on the kibbles. In the vacuum coater, there is a more or less a mass flow of, of, of kibbles. Um, so the kibbles, they are uh, being mixed in the vacuum coater. Um, 
And in the end, the, the kibbas are, I should say, all kibbas are really, um, they, they, they have a, a layer of oil over the surface. And that should be as homogeneous as possible. Well, next step is emptying. Um, now we're emptying the bottom doors. And typically what you see is that when once emptying, this is very fast. So this was a batch of approximately 2000 liters and it's empty in approximately 20 seconds. The vacuum process. Um, I cannot give you a clip of uh, the vacuum process, but uh, what happens during the vacuum process is that we have the vacuum coater. Let me see if I can get a laser pointer. We have the vacuum coater over here. This is the vacuum coater. And, uh, and we have a vacuum pump or a vacuum pump set, one or two pumps. And with this vacuum pump, we generate this, uh, this vacuum in the vacuum coater. It's going to take approximately 40 seconds, 45 seconds to create this, um, this vacuum. Um, we have been talking about deep vacuum. Typically, what we see is that atmospheric conditions, what we live in, is approximately one bar. Uh, deepest vacuum po possible is zero bars, absolute uh, vacuum. Um, in aqua feed, typically what you do is you go to a vacuum that is as deep as approximately 0.2 bars. Sometimes we go even deeper for some applications, um, the vacuum that is generated is less. Depends on how much oil you want to have infused in your kibble. Um, I said before, in the, in the vacuum coater, we have these kibbles and they are mixed around. But what you cannot really see on previous clips is what really happens in this uh, in this vacuum coater, how the how well the product is is mixed. And oh, this should be a clip. Let me check if I can rid of the get rid of the laser pointer. Yeah. Okay, what you see here is uh, you're mixing flakes with pellets to have uh, nice colors and how fast this unit mixes. And what you're seeing here is that actually in, in within eight to 10 seconds, it's mixed very well. And this is something that is absolutely necessary to have a good, um, Rigidity, the, the, the kibbles really have to spread well through the mixer to have one spraying liquid on the kibbles to have a good homogeneous um, surface of, of, of uh, oil on all kibbles. Okay, I'm trying to speed up a little to uh, keep my time. Um, basics of, of aquafeed. So what you need is more or less, you need this uh, vacuum coater. Uh, since it's a batch process, there has to be a buffer hopper on top with which in the, the product comes from the dryer. Typically, this is a continuous process. So from the dryer, you have an end feed in the buffer hopper. And once you have a batch ready in, the, um, in this buffer hopper, it will be unloaded into the vacuum coater. And either the buffer hopper or the vacuum coater can be on load cells to really determine the, the batch size very well, or it is even possible to have both on load cells. Um, next to that, what is important uh, is, of course, the liquid uh, additions. And for that, we have multiple systems. One of the possibilities that we have are uh, skits like the one on the picture shown. So it's, um, it's a tank, and in this tank we can, um, uh, we can have an infeed from the um, storage tanks. Um, and in these tanks, we uh, weigh the oil that is required for one batch. 
So when you have a, a batch of 200 kilos of oil that is required um, for one batch in, uh, in the vacuum coater, then uh, that batch will be pre-weighed in this uh, in this weighing tank, and with the pump, it will be injected in the vacuum coater. Um, what we see uh, lately is, especially in aqua feed, is that um, there are quite some problems with the uh, with the, the the well the, the, the fission and the, the crustaceans. Um, sometimes it is necessary to add medication drugs to um, to the feed. Um, I think the vacuum coater has some very good um, possibilities for these. What we can do is, for example, is that we can add medication to the oil. And what you see here on the, on the, on the picture is a system. On the right, we have a tank, a preparation tank, in which we can mix uh, oil with a drug. And uh, there is a special uh, grinding pump next to that. And with this grinding pump, what we do is we uh, make an emulsion uh, in which the uh, powders are thus fine uh, that we can, um, once we inject this, this emulsion on the uh, kibbles in the vacuum coater, that as well the oil as the, uh, as the drugs can infuse, can penetrate in the kibbles. Uh, typically, the next step then is once that has happened, that um, another liquid is uh, injected uh, on the kibbles, and that typically is a hardener uh, to have a capsuling of the um, of the of the oil, uh, the medication that is inside in the, in the kibbles. Uh, another system that uh, that we do supply is. Um, a colorant system. Um, on the on the screen, what you see is um, um, quite a complex system, I have to say. But uh, it is a system in which we uh, dose a colorant in in water. Um, that mixture is added in um, in, a, in a weighing scale uh, to, with an oil. Then the oil and the, the water and the powders, they are mixed together. And this uh, emulsion is again injected in the vacuum coater on the kibbles. Um, and this, this way we can uh, add a colorant, a powder colorant uh, to the kibbles. Summary of the process. Um, there, that's, this was, a, of course, a, already quite a lot of information. Um, so just to summarize, what do we do? Well, we have um, a buffer hopper uh, on top of the vacuum coater, and there we have a, a batch of, uh, of, of, of products. Well, this product uh, um, goes into the vacuum coater. What, would, what do we do? We open butterflies on top of the vacuum coater. The product from the buffer hopper unloads in the vacuum coater. Um, then we close uh, the butterfly valves. Um, we create a the, the vacuum, uh, and once the vacuum is created, only then we start mixing. Uh, once we start mixing, we do inject the liquids, uh, probably a second liquid. And once uh, the liquids are on the on the kibble, then we break, we release the vacuum, uh, depending on um, how much oil. Um, that you want to add, but also on the absorption capabilities of the kibble. This can take typically between 30 and 90 seconds. Um, then there is a possibility to top coat the pellets uh, after this breaking of, of the vacuum. So that will be under uh, atmospheric conditions. Uh, once that is done, the, the process is ready and we can unload the coated product. Simultaneously, the liquid is, um, is prepared, so uh, all steps are done in the, um, in the, in the um, liquid system, from which we, you have seen a picture before um, in, uh, in previous sheets. Well, then to the, to the equipment, uh, we have batch sizes available. Smallest one is 10 liters, biggest one is uh, 
3,000 liters um, tonnage per hour. Depends a little bit on, on product, of course, but we can achieve something like 25 tons per hour in a vacuum coater. Um, we have the, the standard versions with uh, in, in mild, mild steel, but uh, on the other hand, we also have high-end versions, stainless three, steel 316 with uh, CIP cleaning possibilities. Uh, small uh, units are available. This is a pilot uh, unit. Um, and from what you see on the clip, uh, with this unit, we can inject liquids, we can inject powders uh, in the, in, on the kibbles in the vacuum coater. This is the vacuum pump set. Um, we have seen it before, but uh, it's not just a vacuum pump that is required. Uh, when you um, vacuum a vacuum coater, uh, there is always moist air and even fatty air in uh, the vacuum coater. So it is always necessary to have a, a filter unit between the uh, vacuum coater and the vacuum pumps. Oil system, uh, well, you have seen it before. Uh, a lot of uh, oil systems can be supplied. We have uh, weighing hoppers on skids. We have uh, just dosing pumps with some mask flow metering, or for example, what you see on the on the screen, um, a cabinet with uh, huge uh, tanks. Um, these are 400 liters to uh, inject from this cabinet with the pump that is on the screen. Um, 400 liters in one batch in, uh, in a vacuum coater. Um, not only uh, oil with very large quantities of uh, um, uh, can be added to the to the kibbles, it is also possible to add, of course, uh, lower uh, percentages, lower quantities of oil, uh, or even to add vitamins, um, enzymes, just name it. Also, therefore, we have uh, systems available, and that is also possible uh, in this Pegasus double shaft uh, vacuum coater. Uh, powder systems, um, as I said before, uh, powders to be mixed in the oil or even on a, uh, on a kibble and then coated uh, afterwards with, uh, 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 with a hardener. For liquid injection, uh, very important to have a good liquid injection. The oils must be injected uh, uh, in the system uh, in a good way to have a homogeneous layer of oil on the kibbles. These are the liquid nozzles that we use, flat spray nozzles. Typically we have six, eight or 10 nozzles on a, uh, on a vacuum coater and each nozzle is uh, controlled by um, uh, electro-pneumatic uh, ball valve. Uh, when you only have a small amount of liquid, then maybe we only use two nozzles. Do you have a huge amount of, uh, of oil? It's even possible that we use 12, 12 nozzles. Uh, very important uh, in that all is to have a good control of, uh, of, of the process. Um, a machine is a machine, uh, it's steel, uh, the control are the brains of the system. In this control system, what you do is um, that that really uh, creates your kibble. This is where it all happens. So control is very important. Um, then going uh, to the innovations, um, it is more and more requested to have a full emptying of of uh, of batches from the vacuum coater. The environment is uh, fatty, it's a um, lot of, of uh, product inside. Uh, to prevent contamination, it's really necessary to have large bomb doors over the full lengths to make the unloading of the kibbles um, from the vacuum coater as good as possible uh, in the end. Then another thing that we are supplying more and more for, uh, even in, in, in aqua feed, is body heating of the vacuum coater. Um, when the vacuum coater is, uh, is on a certain temperature around 40, 45 degrees Celsius, then the, what you see is that the oil stays better liquid. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't stick to the body that much. So in the end, when you have a body heating on a vacuum coater, it empties better. It 
the oil is really goes well inside um, and it just empties better. Well, one of the questions that, uh, or multiple questions that we had uh, when starting the presentation was why using vacuum co coating? And um, it's all about uh, ad adding high quantities of, of liquid, improving energy content, um, better palatability. So uh, that's uh, the attractability of the kibble uh, to be sure that uh, the kibble is e eaten by, by the fish, by the crustacean. Um, the addition and the protection of, of drugs, of, of medication, is, uh, we have all seen it in the presentation. It's all possible um, with vacuum core coating. Um, next to that, we're talking about batch control processes. Very important, as I said before, it is the brain of the system. Um, well, some key figures. Um, why use a double shaft pedal mixer with, uh, without vacuum? Well, it's efficient, high speed, low energy, low, no breakage, low shear. Why using vacuum? Higher percentages of, of uh, vacuum, multi-layer, multi really have the liquid infused in the, in the core of the kibbles. Thank you for your attention. Up to you. Okay, Peter, thank you very much. That was most informative. I think that uh, people now have a better idea of what's required to do vacuum coating of a uh, aquatic pellet. Okay, we had previously had Ed on and we went through his uh, bio. So I don't know if we need to do that again, but Ed, are you ready to take over? Yes, sir, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, okay. we can see that. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, as we were speaking, the preconditioner uh, is a part of the extrusion system. So we see a picture of the extruder here and uh, we will have uh, the preconditioner sitting on top of the extruder barrel. So as you can see here. Uh, right at this point. And here's the picture of uh, advanced precondition that we're gonna talk about. Talk about. And uh, let's uh, review our agenda for today. We're gonna speak about the importance of preconditioning. Uh, we're gonna speak about the advances on preconditioning design, uh, the process tools for precondition, which is very important in the conclusion. So when we talk about uh, extruder, aquatic feeds, as Peter uh, mentioned, uh, mixing, how important mixing is and how important is control. If you wanna make uh, a quality feed, you must have control of the process. So the extruder provides the mechanical energy and thermal energy for mixing, kneading, melting and cooking to create a plasticized product, which can be very durable and water stable. Uh, and we also want to control the density and buoyancy of the feeds. If you want to make it floating, if you want to make it suspended like a neutral buoyancy, or you want to make it slow sinking or fast sinking. And that's how the uh, precondition comes in hand uh, when we talk about uh, controlling the process and making a high quality feed. So we look at the extruder, extrusion system here as a cutoff. You, see, you can see the live bin here. Uh, where you're gonna add the feed, the dry feed to the preconditioner, which is right here. And this is where we're going to mix. This is where we're gonna, we're going to provide the mixing of water, most of the water, most of the steam, which is absolutely necessary to cook uh, the starch portion and some of the functional protein that you may have on your formulas. Um, so, and then to feed this product down to the extruder barrel, which is not a very good mixer. Uh, so we want to maximize the preconditioner. So talking about precondition design, Winger goes way back uh, on the first unit that might in 1948, 48, that might look like a, a vertical uh, system like this. And then we came up with a double shaft in 1968, uh, dual diameter cylinder, which is a huge, uh, uh, 
uh, improvement to the industry. This preconditioner uh, has fitted so many extruders around the world. And, uh, and it's funny, it's interesting that uh, it's all spread in about 20 years. And then we came up with the high intensity, or engineers came up with the high intensity preconditioner, uh, which we call HIP in 2008. And short after that, we came up with the HSC, uh, which, is, which is the high shear conditioner. And we're gonna speak about this too late designs. So when we talk about preconditioner, uh, we want to allow the particles to be mixed, hydrated and heated which we cannot do in the, in the barrel as efficient. So we, we have a cutoff. If we're doing any feeds that's below 17% total moisture, we probably don't need a preconditioner, but we're going above this, and this is true for aquatic feeds. Uh, you know, we're gonna process in around 28% moisture and sometimes even higher if we're talking about shrimp. And if we're talking about micro feeds, we wanted to, have a very good uh, moistened particle uh, at the extrusion process. And this is, is, is needed to, to be happening at the preconditioning stage. And you want also uniform uh, hydration, uh, low CV coefficient of variation at this stage, you want to mix in and partially cooked raw materials prior to the extrusion so you can make everything efficient. And if you remember, uh, when we're doing, we're dealing with uh, the transformation in our formulas, we're dealing with starch. Starch will provide uh, the binding if we're talking about sinking, uh, and it's going to provide the expansion if we're talking about floating feeds. So we, we're talking about 20% starch in floating feeds and about 10% minimum in sinking feeds. So uh, to cook starch, we need energy. You know, we need moisture, we need heat, and we need time. And this is mostly is going to happen in the preconditioning stage. If we look at the energy uh, on the system here, uh, we can see that the preconditioner correspond to 46% of the energy, the thermal energy is coming from steam right here. And uh, we can add the preconditioner, the water, the energy of the water and the mechanical energy of the precondition and that accounts for more than 54 percent of the energy in the system so this is how this component is important this process is important uh for the for the extrusion system and if we look at controls here you can see that we have all of this water and all of this steam going into pre the preconditioning stage so it's very important that we have a very good system that provides that mixing, that hydration, that heating. So we came up with two designs or our process engineers came up with the two designs that we spoke about. One is the HIP and the name, uh, the name is uh, high intensity preconditioner because it brings a different view of, uh, of cooking in a preconditioner or, or providing the mixing and, and the hydration necessary and the heating necessary uh, to the process. And that is basically uh, really important to have a, su a superior mixing, which these two systems bring. And then one to the right is the high shear preconditioner, which also contributes with the high mixing uh, by uh, being able to control this uh, by your, uh, your control system. Uh, the high intensity preconditioner uh, brings a completely different view of preconditioner, which before we were looking at retention time, and now we are looking more of the intensity of the mixing. If we improve the mixing on a preconditioner, we will improve the hydration, we will improve the heating. So this uh, equipment uh, came uh, is fitted with two motors, which drive drives the shafts independently. So you can now uh, have a, so many uh, configurations uh, just by just changing the speed and the direction of those shafts. Uh, so uh, that increases the distributive mixing. And uh, we found out that even at slower speeds, uh, this machine can have two times more bitter contacts to the feed 
than the original, the prior model, which is the DDC. Uh, the retention time can be varied and as the intensity can be varied. And this is, improves the steam absorption due, due to the steam uh, going inside the feed uh, in everything is suspended. Everything is uh, flying around because this condition is turning everything so fast. Uh, so we have a better contact the feed with the feed and the steam and the water, which we'll see uh, in the advanced uh, control or hardware that we bring the water and steam into the system. And as you can see, we also have sanitation improvements on the shafts. We don't, we don't see any more threads or bolts uh, holding the beaters to the shafts. And the beaters are, ne are very narrow, uh, so we don't get a, a product crust on those beaters. It, they are very slick, very uh, smooth. And to move that feed forward and uh, in a very efficient way. You can see that as we speed, we speed up uh, the, the intensity on this preconditioner, the green line is the 100% uh, mix intensity, which is the highest mix intensity, which the chefs are turning very fast. Uh, the system allows this to happen and we can get more retention time, more mixing, more cooking at different rates. We always, we always have that, uh, uh, increase in retention time, increase in mix and increase in cooking at the precondition. So uh, essentially when we increase the speeds, uh, we increase the mix intensity and the differential speeds increase mix intensity, uh, increasing mix intensities enhances hydration. Uh, increasing mix, mix intensity reduces clumping, which is a, a major problem in preconditioning. Increasing mix intensity increases retention time as well as we saw. So looking at clumps, uh, these, these are clumps about five millimeter in diameter. So uh, a quarter of an inch. And as we increase the mix intensity on this preconditioner in this very advanced design preconditioner, we can see that the clumps, the quantity of clumps decline, which is what we want. And if we look at the picture here, the prior, the, the prior uh, model that, which is the DDC, it's a great conditioner, but it doesn't mix as well as the HIP uh, with 30% oil addition. You can see that the feed is much more uh, fluid and doesn't have those clumps that we talked about, uh, which means that it's not mixed well. Um, and if you look at slurry addition, this could be uh, uh, meat, added uh, or could be vegetables or in case of aquatic feed could be uh, fish slurries added to the preconditioner. These uh, pictures were taken at 30% slower slurry addition. And when we turn it low mix intensity, uh, you can see that the clumps uh, may appear, but when you go to high mix intensity, the clumps tends to disappear, which indicates a very good mixing. Um, we have, uh, uh, Wenger offers five different models uh, from anywhere from one ton to, uh, per, per hour to 20 ton per hour on a model 3000. Um, the HSC, which is the, the, the second precondition that we talked about, this is a, a, a simpler design, but yet very sturdy and allows high speed, uh, which is the main uh, goal here when we develop this advanced preconditioner system. Uh, this is a single uh, shaft design, but it's conical, which is where all the technology actually lies because uh, then we can uh, compress the feed towards the end and get very good results for mixing uh, hydration and uh, improving uh, the, uh, the, the cooking of the product at the preconditioning stage. Uh, we can also have uh, a very high production on these machines as we move into really high production and uh, to lower the cost of producing, for example, uh, floating fish food. We can now do uh, up to 30 tons per hour on, on some of our single screw machines. The HSC performance is really great because the, the mixing 
on this machine is very high and the coefficient of variation was down to 2.5%. Uh, we saw also in the formula permitted a uh, very a highly increased in starch gelatinization to about 40 to 44% if we have enough starch there and it capable of high discharge temperatures greater than 90 degrees C. And of course, this is compared, it's the lower steam inclusion, which, which is uh, a big deal here uh, because we now we can use the steam energy uh, more efficiently. Um, we target the use of the HSC to low fat floating and sinking aquatic feeds, high fiber aquatic feeds in specialized shrimp feeds and specialized micro feeds. Uh, with the only limitation on, the, on this design is the quantity of moisture or slurry that can be added to about 20% to 30% the most of uh, uh, slurry inclusion. But we can go up as high as 26% moisture inclusion. Uh, as we spoke, this machine can go up to 30,000 30, kgs per hour on the biggest model. So, and we, we did a comparison and the HIP and the HSC uh, has a very low CV coefficient variation, which we are searching for. We want that mixing to be per perfect there because it's the mixing of the system compared to other models. Uh, we also improved the addition of water and steam to these units. Um, before we had, you know, the, the injector valves underneath the, 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 the preconditioner, which caused a lot of uh, plugging problems is also a very difficult uh, uh, to maintain a very uniform flow uh, of steam in every nozzle. So we came up with, with the mixing of the water and the steam together on a device called SMI, steam and water mix injector. And what this does is combines the water with the steam, heats up the water, and the water uh, cools the steam enough to get it uh, condensate. And we only use the steam energy if we condensate it. Uh, so this is a fantastic tool because now we can use the, the water to cool down the steam and condensate the steam in contact with the feed. And also we are atomizing these particles inside the preconditioner, which uh, with these advanced models, we are uh, spreading the, the particles inside the preconditioner. So we have this uh, mating in, in flight almost of the water and steam into the particles. We also have a uh, automated startup, which uh, separates the condensate from the steam, which is a great tool. Uh, we can achieve obviously a higher usage of the steam compared to other models. Um, because now we are ab able to add more steam to the precondition and still keep them uh, a very good uh, absorption of the steam. Uh, and we know that the steam tends to try to escape the conditioner cylinder because most of the conditioner cylinders are uh, not pressurized, they are atmospheric. So we came up with this uh, vent control system, VCS, which condensates the, the steam that may want to escape the vessel back into the feed. So this is uh, placed on a chimney of the preconditioner, if you, if you may. And the water flows into here and condensates the steam back into the preconditioner, essentially, uh, you will have no loss of steam and no uh, mass around the preconditioner. Um, we noticed that uh, reduce the incident of condensation above and around the preconditioner. You know, we can see sometimes feeds uh, <coughs> blowing around and this doesn't happen with this uh, VCS installed. Um, in conclusion here, coming up to the end of our presentation, uh, the condition and technology is crucial for produ producing high quality aquatic feed because we want to mix very well and we want to hydrate the particles and we want to uh, heat the particles before it goes into the extruder. And as we saw in the pie, the more we use the preconditioner, uh, very uniform, 
flow out of the preconditioner, the less motor we're gonna use and the better feed we're gonna produce. So essentially this is what we want to see. And we can make you know, anywhere from 0.5 to 60 millimeter diameter using the proper extruder underneath these advanced preconditioner designs. Uh, concluding, we talked about the importance of preconditioning. We talked about advances in preconditioning design and advancing process tools for preconditioning. And we came up to the conclusion. So we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Joe, you are muted. Okay, Ed, thank you very much. I agree that preconditioning is a tremendously important process in the extrusion step. Okay, up next, we have a very interesting topic coming up by Jacques Weinhost. Jacques has been working in the feed industry for 41 years, been a plant manager in the Vietnam, or excuse me, a vitamin a formulation factory. He's worked with Trow International's plant manager of specialty feeds department and later as an international production coordinator responsible for uh, production coordination and technical developments with regards to the group there. He's now a senior consultant as, uh, at Tema and Partners and designed quite a few feed mills. It's like 60, 80 feed mills in uh, 30, 40 different countries. Jacques's got a lot of uh, experience. So let's turn it over to Jacques to learn about the making pulse with less temperature. What is happening now? Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. So, and do you see my screen also? No, your screen's not showing. Strange. Where is where is it? Share screen. Put it in again. It doesn't work, I think. Or I do something wrong. Share screen. Screen. Share. It's working now. It's working. You can't see my screen. No, we can see it. What is going wrong now? Where is it? You are screen sharing. I it's okay, we can see it. Okay, then I'll make it somewhat. There we go and start. Well, I think uh, we have spent a lot of time with the presentations. Uh, do I still have time for my full presentation or do I have to make it somewhat shorter? That is possible um, because the main th thing is that I like to present to everybody, uh, hello, by the way, um, some new items and it is most of the time uh, thinking about an option also to go from the very hard pellets which we make in the normal feed business, fish feed business, um, to think over what the fish itself will think about that very hard pellets. So that is the main um, idea to present to you and give some other thoughts than just the traditional production method. I call it new or back to the past, um, because in the past, if at fish farming, always there was used, um, a, let's say at least if I take as an example, the salmon industry, which was in fact leading uh, in, in the past and it was the real startup in Europe from um, the, for the aquaculture. So I take the salmon feed as an example. And in the past, it was just made on farm from uh, fresh fish or fish offal. And later, um, there was the development of the extrusion technology. Uh, mainly, the company Scratting was the biggest one in the beginning. And I consider the Scratting as the, the real leading company, even until today, um, in the aquaculture business. Well, if we don't, as long as we don't talk about countries like 
China, because China is in fact the largest fish feed producer in the world. But we are talking a little bit more about Europe and the States and South America, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, uh, let me go uh, fast through the presentation, unless you say, uh, Joe, you have all time, because then I go uh, step by step as it origin originally intended. What shall I do? Is there sufficient time to go on, or if do I have to show? Well, let's just continue, yeah. Jacques. We'll see how it goes. I think this is most interesting, so I don't want to skip it. Yeah, go on, Jack. Okay, then I just start like I have the intent. Um, now we have to go here. DR. Okay, does it work? Yes, it's working. There we go. Some words about me very fast. Um, I am heading now, although I'm officially retired, but if you are interested in the business, you never stop. So I'm heading a stream. I'm part of a group of consultants. We are, we are all working independent. But sometimes we are working all together um, in the specialty feed business. So we have uh, people uh, who do nutrition, people who do product development, process technology development and design, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that was the commercial part of it. And this is just stating that we are very uh, experienced. But just forget that, we go to the real presentation. The presentation will give a short history, history of fish feed development in Europe, dry feed properties and production technology, development of semi-moist feed as alternative for dry feeds, and options to produce on-farm feeds and the use of slurries, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, some words about feed properties of feed for slow bottom eating fish. And there we go. The short history of fish farming will lead to the present situation where we make dry feed uh, high in, in, in oil or not. That is depending on the type of fish, of course. As example, we take the salmon uh, and feed production in Norway and illustrate it, as told you before, by the Scratting Company as one of the leading companies. We go back to 1970, 1980. Scratting was that time a compound feed producer and some clients were growing salmon and Scratting supplied press pelleted product. And, and that is uh, the most interesting then, a mixture of fish meal, wheat, vitamins, minerals, and a binder. And they used on farm uh, fresh fish and the farmer itself made with a, some kind of a meat meal. Uh, he made uh, semi-moist feed because there was no dryer. It was just a fresh feed with that meal, with the binder from scratching. The wheat in it, because there was of course wheat in it um, to give some binding or whatever, uh, because that is straight away a remark. We have wheat in, in our fish feed uh, as starch. And the starch is not very good for the fish, but is, that is intended to make a good pellet. So that is why we also use extrusion processes to cook the starch, because raw starch cannot be digested by the fish at all. It is important to, to remember uh, what I say here. The starch is not necessary in the fish feed, only to make the pellet. Well, it's not 100% true, but something like that. Anyway. Um, the scratching people, they were looking for an, um, an alternative because that wheat cooking gave a lot of problems in the base pollution of the fjord water. And that by coincidence, the uh, scratching family decided to sell the, the, the business to BP Oil. BP Oil is an oil company, uh, but there was in that time a, po uh, a policy that if you invested in a country in other type of industry than petrol stations, etc. Then you got um, an extra pay to start up with a line of petrol stations. So that was why BP decided to go to another uh, technology. Also because they had made just a, a plant where they made a single cell protein, bacteria grown on oil. 
And in that time, oil was uh, cheap and um, uh, uh, soya was expensive. Anyway, BP Oil bought the Dutch company Trouw and together with some other companies, there was BP Nut uh, Nutrition. And Trouw became the leading company in the agriculture business because they did already something in it. Then together with Trouw Engineer, it was uh, decided to replace the wheat cooking installation for an extruder to cook the wheat. And then we said, um, together with the process technology from Trow, uh, we make an extruded salmon feed that can be used during the winter when the farmer does not have um, sufficient fresh fish to make his own semi moist feed. Anyway, that's the fish farmer bought only in the winter time the new win winter feed of Stratton. But the product was so easy to work with that they also wanted to use extruded feed during all seasons. And that was a reason to stop their own wet feed production. So that was more or less the beginning of the salmon business. Scatting started a new facility in Aberhoi and the facility got also a new extrusion line replacing the pellet mills. That pellet mills has never been used because we were replaced uh, replacing it by extrusion lines. So the business was growing and also other feed companies installed extruders and the dry extruded feed became standard until the present time. And all over the world, extruded feeds replaced pressed pelleted feeds more or less. That's a little bit the story behind it. Easy to handle for the farmers and very important, giving less pollution of the water. Also extruded trout feed became standard in whole Europe because there the pollution of the water was very important. A lot of trout uh, is produced in, in farms where uh, raceway type, by the way, where they take the water from fresh water rivers and then they uh, bring the water into the farms and the offal water, so to say, the exhaust water is polluted, polluted and was polluting the river and nobody liked that. So, the, the, there was a um, request for low pollution uh, diets, and that is why the extruded fraud, uh, proud, proud, trout feed replaced all the press pelleted stuff. And in five year team time, more or less, everybody changed over from press pelleted to extruded ones. Well, that is then some words about the high fat content in trout, but are international. Peter Raven has explained a lot about the vacuum coating technology. And in fact, the reason was that the market asked products with high oil content. And in February 1990, the technology department of Trouw International developed a process based on vacuum coating technology. The Trouw engineers invited the Dutch feed equipment supplier Dinesen to make their four-brick type of mixer vacuum tight. And the Dutch company Wijnveen installed the machinery in all their fish make, feed making factories. That was fantastic to do. By the way, I was heading that department and I was responsible for that. So that I'm still proud to tell you the history of the vacuum coating a little bit, the origin of the vacuum coating. Of course, uh, the process was kept secret for, uh, secret for a few years. And then it became known how to do it. And then uh, it was in fact, uh, everybody was make, uh, using the high feed production method and Dinesse developed it further and further and further. So that was very well um, and is now standard more or less worldwide. Anyway, why do I say this? Because this has nothing to do with C my moist, but let me have a look now a little bit um, about what is then exactly the feed we make nowadays? First of all, some words about the production technology of extruded feeds. We go very fast. There are, first of all, several materials, raw materials to be dried for shelf life and to, for easy handling. And then I think on uh, blood meal is dried. We want to have it as meal, fish meal is dried and a lot of other stuff also. So that is costing uh, energy. 
why doesn't he go on? Yeah, there we go. And there goes odor out um, and, and, and water loaded air out. That is, let's say, the raw material drying business. Then we go to the fish farm, fish uh, feed company. The feed mill is added water, is adding water in the extrusion process. So it was first dried out and now put in again because the moisture content of the meal, um, and you have just had the presentation of, of Wenger, um, how important the preconditioning is, but there is steam and water again necessary, and that is again energy. And then we have to dry the product back. So we have put in the water and we dry it again to keep it, to uh, give it shelf life. And that is costing uh, energy again. And then we get again odor and water loaded air out. The product has to be cooled with air and also there odor and water loaded air is going out. And that needs, because it smells very bad, odor abatement installation. Anyway, what we see is a, the production of a product with a rather high carbon footprint. Anyway, but what about the very dry feed performance in the fit? What does this fish say from that? Just a question. Has a fish been evaluated during long, long time to eat the very dry products we make nowadays? Feed containing only a few percent of water. If you have high uh, oil in it, then it's maybe two or three percent is the water content in the water. Wild fish is not eating dry hard feed pellets, but is living from prey that contains a lot of water. The fish is living in salt water and needs physiologic saline, which is the, the, the uh, an, uh, sodium chloride uh, solution, the sodium uh, is called physiologic, physiologic saline. And that is um, uh, the sodium solution contains nine milligram of sodium chloride per liter. That is what we have everybody in plants, in organism, uh, in our own body, we all have this um, physiologic saline. Um, solution and that is necessary to grow cells and the cells make meat and that is why we get a larger fish etc. It's very funny that the fish is living in the so in the very uh, salt sea so to say and if we want to eat it we have to put salt on it because it's tasting blend without. That is due to this story of the saline uh, situation. So the dry feed that is eaten needs physiological saline to get wet and fall apart in the stomach of the fish before it's transported to the intestines for digestion. And the fish needs to make this by drinking and getting out the salt by the kidneys, or it gets non-salt containing water by means of osmosis via the skin. That is costing time and energy. And that is why, um, there is a conclusion. Maybe the dry feed should be better if it has a much higher water content. And please understand me well, I'm not against the extrusion technology which we use nowadays. The water in it is very important. We call feed with a higher water content by the way, semi moist. And the wet feed in the past made on farm was in fact very semi-moist. And if you talk with old people, they still say the fish was better growing on that in that situation than in our days. I don't believe that so much because that is always what old people say. In the past, it was better. I also say that very often to my children, but in reality, the future is important and not what was in the past. So after some meetings with my Norwegian friend, Freddy Johnson from Fishfeed IS, we decided to compose a semi-moist feed to test and we tested that at an independent test facility. It worked very well and we saw an increase in feed intake and approximately 10 to 50% better growth compared to dry feed as controlled. And that is a tremendous improvement, but it was of course under test circumstances so we 
went on and went on, and every time we saw the same benefit of the same moist feed. I'm sorry that I'm not able to present you the figures about that, because that would, would make, first of all, this pres presentation far too long, but some of them are also confidential because we did a lot of trials for other companies who were interested in our ideas. Anyway, the feed was based on the absorption of a high amount of an emulsion from oil and fresh water, including an emulsifier agent and some other active ingredients. That was in fact what was done. We took a base product made by uh, an extrusion process by one of uh, the fish feed companies, uh, but without the oil, because we wanted to put it in later together with water. And all tests we did with salmon until today came out very positive. So that's important, we thought. But there is a big but. Nevertheless, none of the important salmon farming companies are using the technology. For the main reason, I'm going to be explained somewhat later. So what are further options for semi moist feeds in aquaculture? We developed semi-moist products for tests with other fish, fish species. And every time we, get, get, we got the same convincing better results. Some examples, we did examples. We did tests with uh, Solea, the Dover sole, I think. Uh, it's the flatfish. Growing the fish from hatching side to market size. So let's say from, from, from in fact, uh, a few grams to uh, 500, 600, 700 grams. We used composition with fresh water and binder. The feed was made by cold extrusion. Outcome very positive again. For a turbot farmer and supplier of ANSYS, ANSYS are um, razor claims. Um, it's a marine bivalve mollusk. We did a trial with expanded floating feed from the market. We just took some feed from the market from a, uh, a major company there. And we looked, we took the, uh, the meat from the, the ANSYS. We ground it to a slurry that could be absorbed by means of vacuum coating technology. And that worked very, very well. And it was also interesting that we discovered that feed with fresh and uncooked slurry was um, significantly better than the cooked ants. So we try, did it again. We tried the slurry with uncooked and cooked fresh fish emulsion. And also there, we saw that the fish was growing better on the uncooked stuff. So we are now convinced that heat treatment is negative if you take products from nature, fresh fish, so to say, or other material uh, supplying um, uh, nutritional good um, proteins and oils, etc. Anyway, if you heat that stuff, then you damage, damage some components. We don't know what it is, so we call it non now unidentified growth material. But there is a nice difference to see. For a shrimp feed producer, we did trial with semi moist feed containing a slurry of insect larvae. And also here we saw positive effects, not only because of the insect larvae, but because we compared uh, it, the, the formula also with the traditional formula, one formula with insect and um, uh, cooked and uncooked, and we saw the same effects again. And then there was a test with semi moist feed for eel parent stock. And when we also used a cold extrusion, no heating. And the mummer in combination with marumerizing technology. And the feed was made on farm in a very simple way. It was in fact in an imitation of cold extrusion and marumerizing. You do that if you do small tests, of course. Anyway, more tests with on-farm made feeds are running now and we see again positive effects now already, although the tests are still going on. 
So we concluded that Sammy Moore's feet are much better than the dry version, but that are still the major feats in the market. And they are based on the easy to handle dry feet type. So I will not say that I'm against this feed. No, it is much easier for the, for the fish farmer, et cetera, et cetera. But I like to present our ideas that we should think all over how to make Sema Moist feed in such a way that it can be also an alternative or, you, or it works together with the traditional feed. Um, but it is an improvement if you can do it. But also the farmers are better off with the traditional feed because if you want to do something and like we did, then the farmer needs to do extra um, uh, an extra production step. Yeah, and they don't like that so much. So they are still better off with the present products. But again, there are chances in the future. So maybe it's better to concentrate on the hatchery starter feed market because there are more options possible. And the technology used here is more special as we can see next. Overview of the technology used by Semi Moist Feed. Then I go very fast. There is the traditional press pellet and extrusion and followed by crumbling and sifting. There is cold extrusion followed by marumerizing, it can also warm extrusion, of course. And there is again, um, then crumbling and sifting. There is compacting technology, there is agglomeration disks, then you agglomerate on a disk, like, like they make um, artificial fertilizer, that's also made on an agglomeration disk. There is fluid bed agglomeration, there is um, I go maybe somewhat fast uh, through this, uh, but I suppose you can later uh, read this in more in detail. There's the flexor mixer. This is again an agglomeration system as micro encapsulation and there is spray drying. These all special technologies are used in uh, the hatchery business and in starter feed. We decided to use as main technology for our experience next technology. Um, it can be based also for grow out feeds and made on form just before feeding. There is vacuum absor absorption techn technology again, and there is cold extrusion of meal dose in modified meat grinders. Anyway, vacuum absorption technology needs, of course, as a basis, um, a dry pellet made in, on traditional extrusion technology. And um, it is then supplied, but without all ingredients like the oils, the coloring agent, vitamins, and every uh, raw material which is damaged during the extrusion process. So it's a very simple uh, starter product. And by the way, I like to remark there also, this product uh, is make, uh, made a pellet uh, again, a porous pellet. It needs starch again. And as we remarked earlier, starch is not a good um, raw material for the fish, but we needed to make a pellet. Okay, that's also here. But the product can be enriched with all kinds of slurries or emulsions, which contain active ingredients. After absorption of the emulsion, the water part or in it um, is absorbed by the pellet matrix material and that weakens to a soft and flexible structure. The result, an on-farm made semi moist product. Well, let's try to do that. And then there is also the cold extrusion of meal doughs. You make a dough in a modified uh, meat grinder or simple extruder as forming machine. It can also be made on, let's say, a very complex and very modern extruder, but you don't use then the precondition so much as um, necessary for the cooking of the starts in the, in the formula. Uh, you just uh, use some other binders and especially you can say, I take for instance, as an example, uh, active 
uh, wheat gluten and you get the wheat gluten as binder in it and that has at the same time a very high protein content so that's better than better than starch but nevertheless with starch it's still possible all dry ingredients are mixed and the slurry or emulsion is made from all liquid ingredients binding agents are mixed into the slurry as well as anti-molding ingredients such as organic acid and you lower the pH to smaller than four and that gives it shelf life if you want to, to keep the product longer. The dry mix and the emulsion, uh, or, and the emulsion or slurry is mixed to a dough and then extruded as cold mix to sinking feet and with some heating if we need floating feet. The extruder can be single, simple and we construct this machine ourselves from a used meat grinder that is nice to do all these trials, but is not for an industrial situation, of course. On lab scale, you even can you buy a pasta extruder um, as you can make uh, at home um, spaghetti or whatever. Such machine can also be used. Uh, you make a dough, put a dough on it, and then you have uh, the feet which you can get out. Anyway, some words about semi moist feed options. If other than traditional technology is used to produce feeds, it is necessary to investigate the physical properties of the feed during use in the field. There are large differences between fish and fish farms and uh, feeds need to be adjusted to it. And I also give this point to think a little bit more about uh, testing the quality of the feeds because we have very often no standard testing feeds and in fact we have to look to the next uh, factor which is uh, important to um, for the properties of the feed well we have hatcheries and that needs special feeds it's a lot of sentences so um, it's better to to read that later anyway um, the processes are for sometimes fluid agglomeration microcapsules in slurries or paste for micro, microcapsules in liquid and spray dry, et etc. et cetera. That is the more special technology. Then there are small local fish farms where feeds can be made by means of cold extrusion, often beneficial if low raw, raw materials are available. But that is for small uh, and somewhat easier to, to make semi-moist feed. Then there are fish farmers with own production facilities. Also here daily production of semi-moist feeds can be made, uh, both by, by uh, extruder for traditional extrusion. What you can do, you make the feed and you skip the drying phase. That means that the formulation must be in such a way that the wet feed, which is coming out, can be handled or you just dry it a little bit but you still can make, why should you dry the feed if you have your own fish farm and you can da daily make fresh feed and you just don't dry it, you save a lot of energy. That is possible. And two clients of us in, um, in Turkey are doing that. Then the future options is even possible for large fish farm and business. And in particular, those companies that, that have a filleting business. There are some people who have a fish farm and they have also the, the, the fish processing business. Daily, they have a lot of um, byproducts from cutting the, 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 the head and the skin and etc. You can make a very nice uh, slurry out of that and you absorb it by means of the vacuum uh, absorption technology and let's say the, the, the extruded base product. That gives very nice um, options. Then some words about feed. Since hatchery feeds are often very special, we concentrate on the, the the, the oh yeah, what is it's hidden now suddenly how is that possible wait a moment yeah 
Uh, we concentrate on the go out stages of the fixed piece. This is also the large turnover side of the feed business, and it will be an option to make the same moist feed at farm le level just before feeding. But we, let's have a look into important properties. We can make feeds for slow eating fish that are living at the pond of the area. Then water stability of the sinking feeds for slow eating fish species, leaching of the essential ingredients if longer in water, losing physical strength of the pellet if lo is longer in water. Does the pellet fall apart into pieces if, if handled and can the fish or shrimp select those pieces and have preferences? Can a semi-moist feed be formulated strong enough to resent pressure when stored in heaps of big bags of big bags or silos? Well, if you look to this, then you say, well, semi-moist, it will be a weak product, et cetera, et cetera. This cannot be handled. But the reality is different. It is just a question of formulating, formulating finding good binders, and you can make, not to store it in, in very high silos. You need maybe a horizontal silo for that, which is just a, um, a belt, uh, where you can uh, store the product. If you make it just before feeding, uh, there are no silos necessary. Anyway, then it is important to see, can the product be transported to the cages by means of kinetic transport without any or just limited breakdown? Well, in fish farms, sometimes there is transport necessary from the barge with the silos and in, in the product to the, 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 the cages in, in the fjord. And then sometimes distances of 400 meter pneumatic transport is there. And we have tested um, in a special testing machine, all kind of air speeds came to the conclusion that in normal situation, people transport the feet very, very fast, uh, far too high. And the dry feet, uh, so to say, is breaking more than the semi-moist feed, um, which is very elastic and doesn't uh, is not so fra fragile for, for breaking down. Anyway, so also there is an option to do something. Now then, um, feed for fast eating fish, such as sea bream and salmon and trout. Or so that is feed which can be produced just before uh, feeding. Anyway, the properties of on-farm production of the final semi-moist feed must be strong enough to be handled in the pneumatic transport for coating machine to the cages, strong enough to be stored on the storage and transport belt, where some maturation takes place. After the coater, the product needs some time to finish the absorption process. I'm talking here with the uh, on-farm made feed. Uh, where we have the slurry and put it in just before feeding. It's also important that feed needs a good mouth feeling for the fish. Think on tuna, for example. The tuna, if it is the pellet is too hard, it will spit it out and say, ah, that's a stone. So that needs a very flexible feed. And you can make that on farm from the dry uh, uh, feed with a bad mouth feeling. You can um, make it soft enough to do. Anyway, where are the installations running making the semi moist feet? That is what you could ask because it's a nice story what I'm telling, but yeah, where are they? Can I see them? Well, a very good question. The answer is simple. simple. We are still in a state that we have to convince farmers to go for new feeds and or partly on production. And that's a difficult job because the traditional feed suppliers have invested in large traditional feed production facilities. And although they maybe can be convinced that the technology can indeed be beneficial and that you indeed get 10 to 50% more growth, just from the water, so to say, then they need a total new approach to the market and they do not like that. And the fish farmer also need to invest in own production equipment and he has to to do some changes in this organization. So also they have difficulties to be confronted with the need for own feed production. Nevertheless, we have now found some companies 
with an innovative attitude. Uh, we are designing the production facilities and two companies with own extrusion facilities will start with it. We have done already quite a lot of trials. They are convinced that it is, uh, is okay and they have invested in the new equipment. Some final remarks. Semi moist feed will never replace the traditional dry complete feed as now produced by some large companies. There is always a lot of resistance for new technology in the world of feed production and farming activity. People doesn't like new LEDs. It gives more trouble. And especially in the time of now, where a lot of people are afraid for their job, etc., they say, well, well, we stay just no risk, no risk. Anyway, there is a but. There are changes for products that are made semi-moist feed on semi-moist on the farm, following the vacuum absorption technology. Because the feed factories can still make the extruded product as well as standardized emulsion or slurries and the supply of know-how, a little bit like a premix producer is doing now. They, produce, they just bring a premix, a seller premix, but they also sell all kinds of know-how to test with animals, et cetera, et cetera. And that can also be the case here. So with this presentation, we like to inform the aquaculture business also about options to lower the carbon footprint of production, feed, and growing fish. It can make the business more sustainable, but it also needs people to have innovative attitudes. I hope that you are belonging to them. Thank you for your attention. Well, thanks, Jacques. That was most interesting. <clears throat> I okay. can definitely see your point, and one that I can somewhat agree with. Most of my experience those with uh, semi moist be extrusion and i've always believed that why would you cook a steak twice to eat it for example yeah. it's just exactly what you're talking about mm -hmm. is cook something twice dry it down to nothing moisten it up again and then dry it down again what are we losing there and i i have to agree from what i've seen you take a ground up fish and put him in the feed the fish that he's being fed is going to like him a lot better that if it started out as fish meal. So I think you're onto something there. Keep up the good work. Okay. Okay. So, uh, go ahead. I see, by the way, that a lot of people have left because there were somewhere 190, uh, 127. I always have the bad luck that if I'm at the end of a day of presentations, and it's not the day now, but a couple of hours, that people are falling asleep or whatever, and they leave and they say, well, it's a nice story, but that's for later, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's as usual, but I liked it very much to be here. And I hope that my presentation gives some thoughts by people. Okay. And of course there is much more know-how behind it, but that is not in the presentation. Okay. Uh, yep. Okay. Well, uh, we have some, uh... Obviously, there's been some questions coming up and, and going through with regards to the Q&A section that you can find at the bottom of your screen. Uh, some of them have been answered, some are still open, and we, we, we still have some questions. Uh, so if the audience is still there, let's see if we can have a, have a little session here and answer a few questions that have come in. Starting off with Vulcan. Let me get this out of here. Okay. What, uh, okay, obviously we have a big discussion today about grinding and particle size distribution, et cetera, et cetera. What is your recommended method to actually determine particle size and uh, generate that distribution curve so we can see where we're at? Oh, that's a great question. And that's an important topic because uh, there are several uh, different methods out there uh, to, de to determine the particle size distribution. For example, you can determine it by screens via a vibration sheaf, a sieve shaker or an, ed an air jet sieve, or there is a laser, there are, out, uh, there, are, uh, there are laser diffraction methods or optical measuring methods. And 
And from my opinion, I wouldn't recommend the vibration sieve shakers because we in fish feed we are dealing with um, with with uh, raw material with high protein and fat levels. So the the small particles need to build up agglomerates, and it's more difficult to um, to get rid of them with a uh, vibration uh, sieve shaker. So. Um, yeah, but there are different areas for, for each application where each method has, has its uh, advantages. So I personally, I would prefer the air jet sieve analysis. Okay, well, that's a fair, uh, a fair answer. I do believe that's quite expensive to have those advanced methods. So most everybody's probably going to use the sieves, but mm -hmm. if they keep a good database, they ought to have a relative idea where they're at. Yes, for example, yeah, it's they can use every uh, method, but with a vibration, uh, vibratory sieve shaker, the, um, there is a possibility that they are that the that the clients are measuring causa particles, but the real particles are smaller in size, so right, the, I, it's I, not. No? I agree, but we can always use the final die as the sieve to see if they uh, ground it good enough or not. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Correct. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, obviously you don't want to do that. That creates a lot of downtime. Okay, Peter Raven, are you ready? When when we're making a very high, I am Joe. Yes, when we're adding a very high percentage. I mean, you and I know the answer to this one. This is a, this is a good one, but it's a good one because a lot of people don't know. When you add very high percentage of liquids, why do they stay inside the extrudate, and how do you keep them from coming out? Um, easy question, difficult answer, <laughs> or let me say many answers. Um, when you have a lot of oil that you want to add to a, to a kibble, to an extrudit, um, you, you need the space inside. That is where, where it starts. Uh, typically, when you add oil under atmospheric conditions, you just add it on the, on the surface, and it takes a lot of time for the oil to penetrate inside. The, the kibble acts as a, as a sponge, but it is a slow sponge. So the oil only goes slowly inside and somewhere it's finished. Um, so you, you will not get more oil inside. With this vac vacuum technology, what happens more or less, you take the air out. And when you add the oil and it's over the surface, you push the oil really inside the core. And once it's in there, uh, vacuum is broken. It, 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 there is no reason for the oil to go out. Right. Expect, uh, accept. Um, when, when, when you just have a kibble lying somewhere, it's greasy. And when you put it on a sheet of paper, it will get greasy also because in the paper, there's not, mu not as much oil as is in a palette. So it really wants to go out, it wants to go to the paper. Um, so what we do to prevent that is um, we add a hardening. Um, a hardening fat or we add we add something as a top layer to the uh, kibbles we inject that and that prevents the oil from coming out so that is typically what we do last step top coating preventing the oil from coming out right um first first of all what is important that the oil gets inside and that is what you need a vacuum coater for right well i i agree with you wholeheartedly that uh, we got to get the oil in there but we have found in extrusion, that if you make a finer cell structure and the cell walls get stronger and, mm -hmm. and the vacuum coat of the oil gets in there and there's less chance it comes out if you have a finer cell structure. Directly associated with specific mechanical energy imparted into the extruder. But it, the thing I found that was beautiful about salmon feeds is the pellets were skinned over on the outside edges but were open on the ends where the knife cut them. Mm -hmm. And it seems like all the oil would move in and out of that particular part of it where if you make a round pellet that comes out skinned all around, it's not as uh, conducive for vacuum coating, but it, it, uh, it can be done and it's a great process. And uh, let's see who we have for some more questions, but thank you for that response, Peter. Ed DeSouza. Yes, Joe, I'm here. You believe in your mind that uh, there's any special care that's needed for a preconditioner and how do you handle, uh, we had a question that was typed in that you can add it to. 
the gap between the end of the beaters and the shell of the cylinder, uh, as that wears, what do we do to decrease that gap so we don't have any buildup, stuff breaking off and blocking the dye? Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, we, we tend to pay attention to the, uh, to the maintenance, the preventive maintenance on extruder quite often. But uh, we tend to forget uh, the precondition as a sealed uh, vessel. And, uh, but yes, uh, as, as the beater wears off, uh, you know, the, the ability to convey the product is lost. So we end up building up inside the preconditioner uh, a longer retention time, which is not, not necessarily good, be necessarily good because some of these chunks can get overcooked and wet and will cause uh, a surging down extruder and bad uh, quality of the pellet. So uh, we recommend a annual uh, measurements of this gap. Uh, so let's say if the precondition starts to a large precondition for 10,000 kgs per hour starts uh, at a gap that is, let's say five millimeters from the shell, the in, inner shell of the vessel, uh, you want to measure that uh, to where is no more than twice that gap, because after that, you're going to start to get uh, uh, it's going to start to give you trouble and which is not necessarily uh, so noticeable uh, if you don't do the preventive maintenance. Yeah, by measuring and if it's possible to adjust, you can adjust uh, the height of the beater if it's threaded in uh, and the angle according to the manufacturer. If it's not threaded, if it's welded on like the uh, new preconditioners, uh, HIP preconditioners, then you will re replace the whole shaft because it was welded to avoid uh, the threads and the contamination well, area. For, for the advancement in sanitation in the in the world on feed production. Yes, thank you. No, that's right. That's why we got those threads were removed because of it's just a bad place for bacteria to develop. Okay, Jacques. Yes. We talk about making semi moist. What yep. are the, the, the number one ingredients used to maintain shelf life? And what would you expect shelf life to be on this type of product that you discussed? Now, there are, of course, two principal differences. If you make the feed just on just before uh, feeding, so then you make this product whereby you absorb a emulsion. Let's say of oil and, and water, for instance, um, then there is no need to put in any um, malt go um, preventing uh, stuff. Right. But if you want to give it a shelf life, yeah, yeah, of course, you have to add. First of all, you have to be sure that the product stays under a pH 4. Mm -hmm. That is one. And you mix in some uh, organic acids like um, acetic acid and um, uh, mirezuur. Peter, what is mirezuur in the Engels? I ask. Phosphoric acids are usually a, a one that's used. Yeah, that, that, is, that, that is correct. Um, yeah. um, anyway, you put in the, 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 the acid mm -hmm. or a salt of the acid. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, propionate can be used, calcium propionic as it can be used, but also calcium propionate. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, th this is just known from a lot of uh, nowadays um, also human food, which needs um, anti mold growth, antibacteria, etc. And that kind of stuff um, is then added to give the product shelf life. And the pH, low pH is important. Okay, now I imagine with the discussion you were having, there yeah. would really not be an intent to manufacture feeds and keep them on the shelf for a year. No. No, okay. Well, people were okay. asking, and I answered some questions that in relation to semi-moist feed in the pet food industry, shelf life could be a year. Yeah, and they but have to do it in the bag and everything just right. But in your case, it's it's a little different. 
no, but that is that. Let's say I also make or advise people, but even I've uh, designed the factory for making um, uh, see my most um, pet food. Yep. There you can say in general, just take five uh, percent of uh, sugar in the formula, and two and a half percent uh, propylenic acid or something like that, and you have already a very good shelf life because the sugar and the propylenic uh, sorry and the propylene glycol they are taking the water which is no longer available for the bacteria etc anymore and you go down with the aw value very well and then you can just store it for a long period of time sure. exactly but correct easy, but that is not possible in the aquaculture because the fish doesn't like sugar right if that was the case it was much easier to make semi moist feed and at the same time, sugar, etc., give certain strengths. So the whole business would be much easier if you could do that. But it's right. just bad luck. The fish doesn't like it. And if at the end of the day, the fish is our client, not the fish feed producer and the fish farmer. The fish is the one who must tell us what is uh, usable and what is not usable. Sometimes now, now, that, that, that. that's a comment I'll agree with. In the end, the fish will tell us what they want. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so will the shrimp. Yeah. We won't decide what they want. They will tell us. Eventually, we'll find out. You see, that is the funny thing. If you take salmon, grilled salmon, you catch them, and you put them in a cage. And then you say, OK, now I have to feed them. You put uh, the nice pellets into the water, which is eaten by all the normal uh, uh, salmon, which is pre trained in eating this dry fish, the wild fish will not eat it. They have to learn it again and again and again. And a lot of mortality happens. We have done tests with this. Well, we, the company I was working for. Um, and then we came to the conclusion that it is indeed, in fact, not so good feed if the wild fish doesn't want to eat it. Yeah, there's logic because he is eating prey and sure. the prey is fish. And this kind of, and, and shrimp, etc., and they are all semi moist, so to say. Anyway, okay, excellent. I agree. Okay, I'll be too enthusiastic because then I keep talking and talking and talking, but that is the reality effect. Oh, really. That's fine. Yeah, Vulcan, let's yes. talk about fiber. What's the maximum fiber that you believe you could deal with in your hammer mills? Uh, in, in, in essence, you know how some of these aquatic feeds are. You have to have a filler in there because you can hit the protein fairly easily in most cases, but you got to, the formula's got to add up to 100%. So they're constantly throwing rice bran at you, wheat middlings, or something else. So talk to me about that. So basically, we will get everything small, uh, <laughs> small enough to get through the screens, but it takes a little bit more, more time because it's more difficult to grind out the, the, the fibers in the system. In the hammer mill system, you have, you have mainly the impact, um, um, which uh, reduces the particle size, but you also have friction. Friction that been uh, from the particles itself and they touch each other and also the friction on the screens. So basically, yeah. Okay, so there really isn't any limit in the terms of fiber other than you're going to have a tremendous amount of wear if you have too much fiber. But uh, it just takes more time and more horsepower to get a certain rate, I'm sure. Yeah, and, and it's, it's not easy to handle fibers, fibers. fibers. Um, so hammer mill systems are also air assisted. That means the fibers, they are, they are lighter than the, than the meal product. And uh, therefore, um, the fibers get sucked faster throughout the screens and then they can uh, uh, cause issues uh, in the grinding system. Therefore, it's uh, very important um, to manage the parameters like the aspiration. There are also uh, possibilities to make adjustments on, on the rotor itself, on the beta configuration. And yeah, there are several parameters there um, to handle uh, the fiber content. Okay, very good. Thank you. Ed De Souza. Ed, you there? Hello, Ed. Okay, we'll we'll hold off for Ed for a minute. Uh, 
All right, here's a good one for for Peter. I sorry. I Peter, see. We we we've, we've lived this experience over the last year, but uh, talk to us about how you could buy a vacuum coater that you can add high levels of oil, and then as the week goes by, you've got some client that wants to make a or buy a yes. tilapia feed that has about Hi. two percent oil on it. What do we do? Uh, so no problem whatsoever. The system that we supply is a vacuum coater and the vacuum coater, you mix the, um, the kibbles. Um, next to that, you have liquid injection systems, the liquid dosing systems. So what you have to design is a dedicated system for the addition of oil for high levels and also for low levels. And with a flexible batch control system, so with the PLC and the brain, as I called it before, it is possible to inject the oils, the high levels of oils, and also the low levels of oils in a homogeneous way on the kibbles. Right. So in essence, the client basically just needs to tell you in advance what's his maximum, what's his minimum. He can end up buying one coating system and have one, one, uh, one operation system for coating, and it's going to be perfect. Yep. All it's right, a, it's it. all about sharing information and that's giving true. you giving us the right information because when we have the right information like we can provide you a dedicated system that really does what you want well we we know that your style coder is a fabulous mixer and it's just a matter of mixing it and adding the liquids at the right way even though it's a low level and you're going to get the job done so thank yep. you very much for that you're welcome ed, ed? Ed DeSouza? Well, he keeps cutting out on us. They must be having some uh, electrical problems up in Sabetha, Kansas. Okay. Uh, Jacques? Yes. I'm Let's there. get back, back to you for a minute. Do you think that uh, in this ever-changing area of aquatic feeds uh, advancing, that we will get back to a point where farmers want to make their own feeds on farm, much like well, you've said. Look, look, there is a remark of uh, a lady, Karin Veverica. She says, I also know a tilapia farm in Zimbabwe that fed fresh, non dried, extruded feed. It makes sense. That's very funny because it is maybe the farm. I was visiting a long time ago. They had a very simple, simple extruder and they made a um, product for tilapia in uh, Lake Cariba. So maybe she is talking about the same farm because I said, if you make your own feet and you have your own farm, why, why the hell do you dry it? And they stopped drying it. Uh, so that is very well, a very good option. If so people who invested already in, um, in extruders because they are not a feed supplier, but they want to make their own feed. And that is in a lot of countries possible in Africa and whatever. We are not talking about the salmon business in, in, in Scotland and in, in Norway and in Ireland and Chile, etc. No, that are the very, very big quantities uh, which are there produced and that is the high top. Uh, there you have your very big extruders of doing 25 tons per hour, et cetera, et cetera. So in local situations, if you buy indeed a small extruder, which is more or less a farming machine then, okay, there is some precondition and possibility, but then you don't just, you just don't dry it because that's not necessary. The feed is to make strong enough to put it in a bag or in a whatever and you bring it to the fish farm and then you give it to the fish that works very very well and saving a lot of energy and money okay. it's possible so i think that there is a market for people um, who are um, doing that and secondly if you think on the id then there is people coming from the food business or whatever, have an education in that, find out very good binders, et cetera. That, for instance, I make products without any starts in it. The fish doesn't like the starts. And if you have to make a pellet uh, only because you need starches in it, 20% in an extruded product, well, the fish doesn't like that. 
So people must think a little bit also in an other direction and forget for, in fact, that is for me the way of thinking on it. Forget the extrusion equipment or the grinders or whatever there is. Start with the fish. Then you have the nutritionist who should make a composition and also not thinking on the traditional raw materials, but what is exactly good for the fish? How do you imitate nature? And then you get certain raw materials and based on that, you choose your process. And then of course you can go back to press pelleting or extrusion or cold extrusion or a forming machine and all this kind of stuff. But if we leave a little bit the very traditional uh, way of fish formulating, feed formulating, I mean, yeah, then, then um, you always need to have the same type of, of, of products. And that is a little bit the problem of the whole feed industry. If you go to the victim once per four years, which shoot the exhibition, which is worldwide uh, known, so to say. And everybody from the feed business should go there. But if you go there more often, it is just one reunion of people who meet each other, but you never see new equipment. You see modifications of what is already there, but never new technology. It's always pellet mills, extruders, sifters and hammer mills. Okay. And then they uh, more uh, slowly come to the conclusion that it is better for the process to go for better grinding. And that is also why I, I know the teaching company very well. Um, and I'm a little bit surprised to see, by the way, I, for me, it was also a hammer mill construction company, but you have now also pulverizer. Very good, because that's what you need. And not only for shrimp feed, for water stability, now, in general, for all products, it's, it's just the process of getting, um, if you need to make a good pellet in the normal compound feed industry also, you need to have fine pellet, fine products, fine meals to get the effect of the water and uh, done. And the gelatinization is a very important process if, if it is coming from the starches, that's different from other binders, but okay, we, we have the starches in the, in the normal compound feed business. So the finer the product is, the better goes the process. So that is important, but in general, um, compared to the food industry, for instance, there is not very much technology in our business. And if you look indeed around and suddenly is somebody asking, I want to make this or want to do that. Okay, we can make a fantastic product with, with uh, alginates in uh, calcium chloride uh, baths, etc. And then you need just a very simple machine for this and that and etc. But yeah, we from the feed industry, we do not like new things. That's the same with the raw material. Tell the, uh, somebody the raw material and then he even might say, my extruder doesn't like that this new raw material, so it doesn't come in. Because that is that is very funny, but it is, that's the re reality. Well, I, mean, well, I, don't, I don't think there's- I talk too much again, forget it. No, I don't think there's many of us still around that recall hearing those comments about, we changed the ingredient, the extruder went in the tank. Yeah. How many times have we heard that over the years? But yeah. you are yeah. exactly correct. I can recall when we had to find out by doing tests, is that ingredient extrudable? Because nobody yeah. knew, you know, and what will happen when we put that through the extruder? Yeah. In any case, thanks for that. Okay. Okay, back to Peter. We have a, a couple of questions. I'll combine them into one. One is if we were to add a dry powder in the vacuum coder while doing the coating, is there any specifications that we need to know about that dry powder in terms of its micron size or anything like that? And then the, the second part of the question is how difficult is it to deal with hardening oils in the, in the plant? In other words, I guess you have to have heat trace lines, et cetera, or talk to us about that. You're you muted. We don't hear Peter. Okay. okay. So first about the the, the, the size of the, the powder. 
uh, what you have to, to get, take care about is that a powder is this small that it can really penetrate in the in, in the in the structure of the kibble. Uh, what we have seen in the past is more or less that um, you have to add the uh, the powder to the oil, and then what will what what we will do with our system is we will grind the the powder in the oil. Um, the, this process of grinding the powder in the oil it has to command so long that the powder is, while well, actually smaller than five microns. Um, that's one. Next is that the, the kibble, um, I said before, the, the pores have to have the possibility to absorb this mixture, this emulsion. Uh, when grinding has been great grinding, teaching, they did a job. Uh, Preconditioning, uh, pre good, nice extruder, nice product. And that all ends up at a va vacuum coater. And there we can add this emulsion on a product that has the capability of absorbing this oil with this powder in it. When one of the steps before um, has not been uh, as efficient and as perfect as requested, it can be a, well, it, it can be impossible to get this uh, powder inside. Um, when you have had case hardening, for example, then probably not all uh, powder will uh, be absorbed by the kibble. So kibble quality is of utmost importance. Okay, how about the uh, handling then, the, yep. the oil, the hard oils? Yep, They're then the hard oils. Oil. Yep, um, well, you need, you need an, um, a liquid, uh, let's call it the liquid, that uh, hardens already at uh, higher temperatures. So temperature should be above 25 in Europe. Uh, uh, some countries probably even a little bit higher. Um, sure. well, all your system, your complete system has to be designed for these temperatures. So your storage tanks, for example, they have to have the possibility to, to heat up your oils, your fats. Uh, next to that, your pumps, your um, piping, everything has to be designed for that. And that is, is absolutely of utmost importance. When you don't do that, it will not be possible to add a hardening oil to your, to your, to your kibble. It's, uh, it's all in the design. All right, perfect. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Ed, glad you joined us back. Or, or Lucia, go ahead. Oh, I think Peter needs to leave. So, okay. Thank you, Peter. Correct. Oh, Thank yeah. you, You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Nice spending so, some bye. time with you. Bye, Peter. So, Joe, we can go on for a couple more questions to okay. Ed and, and Volker. Well, I want to get Ed back in here. Ed. Bye. Yes. What are the yes, most Joe. important indicators that the preconditioning is being achieved, or at least the level that we want? And secondary to that is having some uh, factory experience with the HIP. I've noticed that when we do a really severe job of preconditioning, I mean, really go for it. We're getting a higher amount of production out of the extruder in terms of these sinking tilapia feeds. And I, I'm trying to come to grips with it. They're, in other words, they're not running the extruder the way I would run it. They're running it the way they would like to run it, which is a lot higher preconditioning. B, it causes a lot of... Uh, the conditioner builds up a lot of stuff and breaks off eventually, but and then it gets out of balance because of the buildup and on the jabs. But in essence, yes. they're fogging it through there because of this high level of preconditioning. But I believe it's because of the high fiber. But you answer. Yes, Joe, you're right. Uh, the 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 way we want to look at the preconditioner. Um, job is uh, first of all you want to look for uh, for the absence of uh, clumps. So you collect a moisture, uh, a co collect a sample, and you look at how uniform the sample is mixed. Mm -hmm. That is going to tell a lot about the preconditioning step. And also, we want to check the moisture on it. And as my colleague said, you know, moisture is very important for the production of feeds uh, because you want to uh, cook the starch portion and you want to make a, 
a cohesive uh, keyboard, you want to make a, a, a keyboard that expands or sinks and holds up in water, uh, even though if you are uh, doing a low cook, uh, uh, like a shrimp feed, you want to, you know, diminish the cook or you want to use more thermal cook, you want to make sure that you have the right uh, quantity of moisture required to process those feeds. So we want to take this product to a lab uh, and uh, check the moisture on it. So mixing, which is a visual, uh, you can do a CV analysis, uh, coefficient of variation, but you want to check the moisture and also the temperature. If you want to achieve a high temperature for expanding the feed in the end of the extruder, or just you want to make a product that is low cook, uh, high moist, uh, and then you can use uh, or not use temperature at all. You want to mix uh, the liquids, the slurries, and you want it to have this a good mixing out of the preconditioner. So, yes. Um, and if you have fiber, usually it's more important to have lots of water uh, in the preconditioning stage to uh, soak up that fiber and allow it to hydrate. Perfect. Okay, Ed, I think we're losing you again. There you go. You're back. Say one, one other point. Did you, your microphone is off. I can't hear you. But in any case, uh, what would you say would yes, be Joe, please. The, the highest moisture content you've seen inside of a preconditioner, typically when they're running? Low 30s? Well, Yes, uh, normally uh, we want to shoot for something like 25%, uh, 26% 26% for floating fishes, uh, fish food. And we're talking about shrimp or uh, especially shrimp or, or uh, starter feeds. We don't want that feed to get hot at all because of the small, the small particles. Uh, and it will to flow out of the dye you know, fairly cool. Uh, otherwise, it's gonna it's gonna block the dyes and it's gonna it's 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 going to start to expand and it's gonna be a mess. So if you wanted the 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 feeds to flow nicely with a very small particles or shrimp food, which we want to prevent that thermal uh, that mechanical energy to 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 be influencing the quality of the pallet, you want thermal energy. Uh, to do the cooking, so uh, you want to add a lot, lots, lots of water. Um, okay. So we have managed uh, anywhere in, you know, low 40s, high 30s uh, moisture, in a, even higher than that. If you are, if you want to make like, uh, or colleague Jack's brought, you know, if you want to make a, a high moisture feed, you can manage very lots and lots of moisture into these new design preconditioners. They were made to handle high moisture. Well, you're going to have to get with Jacques or get somebody to get with Jacques and tell them what you're doing with this new meat machines. <coughs> Excuse me. And the fact that you can handle 75, 80% meat and make a pellet in an extruder. Do it with thermal cooking instead of mechanical cooking. Jacques may have interest in something like that for these high moisture feeds that he's interested in. Yeah, yeah. Can I can I ask a question to add? First of all, um, absolutely. Your, your your preconditioner. Absolutely, I'll, I'll love. Okay, uh, your preconditioner. You have presented that it can do a lot of work, a lot of work. So if I'm going to make a, um, there's a little bit of conclusion. If we look to the total extrusion installation and I want to make uh, shrimp feed, you know, you have to, 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 to beat the Asian uh, producers of extruders, et cetera, et cetera, because they are so much cheaper that uh, it's difficult to sell a complex <coughs> in the rest of the world, so to say. But if I hear you now and you say this precondition is precondition, I agree 100% with that. If that unit is working very well, then the extruder barrel can be just a forming machine because we do not need expansion. And that means that the concentration is on the preconditioner and that very expensive barrel with all those wearing parts and screw elements and uh, et cetera, 
is not necessary. It can be maybe a very short um, uh, screw and a very simple barrel. And if, of course, the, the die is very important. So you, you, need, you need surface and open the surface, etc. And if you make the very small fish feet or, or shrimp feed pellets or starter feed pellets. Uh, but I'm wondering if you can't make, if you can't adjust your extruder machine uh, just as a forming machine under a very high quality preconditioner. That is what I yes. think over. Uh, so that also yeah. equipment from the Western countries can be sold in, let's say, Africa uh, and, and, and everywhere where people do not have too much investment money, so to say. Is that an option? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I, yes. Can I go now? Yeah, uh, sure. Well, we, we've, we've learned a lot uh, recently in extrusion technology with, with all the uh, new advancements that we have. Uh, we've developed uh, what I call advanced technology for extrusion, mm -hmm. uh, which is the opposite of what you said. We found that uh, developing an extruder, which is high volume and uh, very precise, uh, have a, a precise conveying an extruder barrel coupled with a precondition that can give you high levels of mixing and high levels of moisture uh, we can produce a, a really a, a range, a huge range of energy uh, from high energy to low energy, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that to high cook from to low cook, but the, the precision of the, of the conveying extruder is so important to make a very a high quality pellet and a uniform pellet. Uh, and what we are seeing is, even though this technology is expensive, uh, these extruders are running uh, so much product in for so long time that we don't think it's going to ever wear out uh, because it's, it's such a nice and, and uh, smooth process and high quality pellets. And you okay. can control the cook in it as much as you want. If you don't want to no cook, just formatting the, the product, you can do it in a very precise way. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 Excellent. Thanks, Ed. Okay. Last question. I'm going to make it a really hard one. Are you ready? Okay. 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 So <clears throat> why do you recommend having two dedicated grinding systems for double stage grinding? each with its own aspiration and, and de-dusting system. It, oh. I like to do two, two part questions. So that's why do you do that? And what is so, the maximum fineness that you can achieve out of your TICM system? Oh, yeah. Thank you for the questions, Joe. So coming back one uh, to the point with the fibers. So we are teaching, we are also grinding 100% of uh, fibers. That means we are, we are strong in the wood and straw application. So we have very much experience about that. And right. in the fish feed recipes, it's also not about the fiber content, but also about the um, recipe composition because uh, fat and protein plays an important role. So it's all about the mixture mm -hmm. that needs to be handled. So coming back to your question uh, with the dedicated lines, uh, it's always preferable uh, to have a dedicated system with defined parameters because uh, hammer mills are air assisted. And if two hammer mills sit on top of each other, as it's sometimes done uh, with one aspiration and a dusting system, it's difficult to control the airflow throughout uh, through both machines. Okay. So in case that the first hammer mill uh, gets overloaded or blocked, the fine grinder um, mill below can run out of air. Uh, and I heard also from a lot of the customers that they complain about the strong vibrations within the setup. So, and then the second question was about the TICM system and the maximum fineness. So I, um, I have not reached the final limits uh, for aquatic feeds but I have ground a product with a top cut of 98% smaller 51 micron. So 
I could imagine that this uh, was was or is the finest fish feed which was ever ground. So. Well, that sounds pretty impressive. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we pretty much have concluded our uh, question and answer period. Yes. Uh, well, I apologize for being a bit late, but I think it was worth it. And uh, thank you very much to the panel for the great presentations and the great discussion. And thanks, Joe, for the great job moderating. And My thanks, pleasure. everyone, for joining in. If you want to stay up to date on the latest news on the aquafit industry, I encourage you to subscribe to our publications on our website, aquafit.com. See you next time. Goodbye. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you guys Bye. later. Bye. See you. Bye. And a good job, Joe. Good job. Thank you. Bye. Bye.